is, uh, are we ready? We're running? Okay. Good. So now I can, uh, we can begin. Um, it's, a, it's really nice to see all of you out here. This is a, a shiur that has history to it. So um, I originally gave this class at the University of Maryland about three years ago during Kolomoy Pesach to about 10 people. And uh, because everybody was away, you know, everyone was away, but I was invited to come speak to the students, and so I came and speak about Sephardic Judaism. And I put it up on YouTube, and uh, as of today, it has over 15,000 views on YouTube. And a lot of comments. Most of them are very nice. Most of the comments are very nice. <laughs> Except for the ones that they said I'm a racist, and I'm uh, divisive, and all of those other things. Anyway, but, um, but you know, anything on the internet, it invites all, all, every element to, to comment. That's the nature of uh, internet, and no matter what you do or say, there's always somebody who's going to uh, get on your back. So out of 15,090 or whatever it is, it's not too bad to have a few, uh, few people who are dissatisfied with the content. But I hope you'll find it interesting. And, uh, and, I, and I look forward to your comments as well. Now on the top of this sheet, there is a sheet that I put, um, I didn't make what I would call a source sheet because uh, I, I didn't want to focus on textual sources so much, but more of like an outline of the different points that I'd like to touch upon. And we're gonna, uh, the original shewer went over an hour, but we're gonna try to condense it to make it a little bit more user, user friendly and a little bit shorter and more focused. So the top of the sheet contains a quote which is from the Rambam, from Maimonides. And this quote is maybe one of the most controversial things that the Rambam ever wrote. Uh, it's lesser known because of its uh, controversial nature. And he wrote this to one of his best students, or probably his best student of all, who was Rabbi Yosef ben Yehuda, not Ibn Aknin, the other one, um, for those who know the Rambam history. Uh, the one that the Moran Nebuchim, his philosophical work, the Moran Nebuchim, was written for, this letter was also written to. And that student established a, an academy, a yeshiva, where he taught according to Maimonides' methodology, and he was very distressed that people were not flocking to this approach of Rambam, that people were criticizing it, people were dissatisfied with it, people were protesting against it and complaining about it. He was very upset, and so he wrote to the Rambam sharing his disillusionment with people's disinterest in what the Rambam had to say. And the Rambam wrote about this phenomenon and said that, you know, I knew there would be people who wouldn't like it, I knew there would be people who would object, I knew there would be people who would attack it, and who would criticize it, but then at the end he says, I refer only to my own time in all that I've described to you concerning those who have not accepted it. He's talking about his book, the Mishneh Torah, his code of law, the Mishneh Torah. Those who have not accepted it, the way it deserves to be accepted. In future generations, however, and you tell me what you think about this quote, in future generations, however, when jealousy and the desire for power have disappeared, all of the children of Israel will be satisfied with my book alone and will undoubtedly abandon all else except for someone seeking to occupy his time for no purpose. Like with Pokemon Go, for example. <laughs> right? so, so the Rambam wouldn't have known about that. right? But what is the Rambam saying? What would you say? When you read that, the first thing you think is like, who does this person think that they are to say that, right? That was a very, it's very bold to claim that in the future, every, of course, right now there's a lot of controversy, but in the future everybody will see the light and everybody will follow my book to the exclusion of everything else. Nobody will even consider any of the other ones because they will be a waste of time. That's a very, very strong position to take. Now, one could at first interpret that as a little bit of hubris, a little bit of, you know, uh, he sounds a little uh, egotistical, you know, he's, he, he, he thinks so highly of himself that his book is going to be the only book studied in the world by the Jewish people. He's not talking about exclusion of the Torah, he's not talking about not reading the Torah, he's talking about any other rabbinic texts, okay? Texts of Jewish law. How could he make such a statement? So, I would suggest, and I, what I hope to, to show, what I hope to explain, is that what the Rambam is really talking about in this very contra provocative quote is he's talking about the way of approaching Judaism that he represented. He's not 
really talking about the specific book that he wrote, like he is so important. What he's saying is that the approach to Judaism and Torah that I am teaching and I'm trying to communicate and to convey is the one that I believe ultimately is going to win the day. It's going to be the one that the Jewish people are going to come to, are going to understand, are going to apply, they're going to embrace it. He's not talking about his particular opinions on every single issue that people will not have different opinions, people will not think differently, they're just going to be indoctrinated with his book. What he's talking about is a certain way of thinking and approaching Judaism. And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. And hopefully you will walk away not with a thorough and total comprehensive understanding of Sephardic Judaism, but a little bit about why we are so passionate about trying to preserve and promote Sephardic Judaism. Like, why is it so important? Why is it so significant? Why can't we all just get along and just forget about the differences and be united and have the same customs and the same practices and the same views? Why are we so tenacious in our defense of our tradition? What's so unique about it? That's what I want to try to con communicate to you tonight. Now, to begin with, an interesting exercise to do, intellectual exercise, is to think to yourself, can we point to any religious figure in the Ashkenazic Jewish world that we know of, and you know some of them, Rashi, of course, is Ashkenazi, you know, you know some of them from history, can we point to any Ashkenazi scholar or rabbi before the 20th or before the 19th century, just to be fair, before the Enlightenment, before the 19th century at least, okay, who had an impact beyond Jewish community and beyond Jewish scholarship, who had an impact on the world around him, meaning the general world, the Gentile world, the secular world. Is there anybody that we can think of in the Ashkenazi world who did that? Now, I just want to preface by saying, having recognition is not that important. It's not important in and of itself. We're not measuring someone's value by recognition. I'm not saying that someone could be very great and somebody could be a tremendous scholar and asset to the Jewish people without having an impact outside of his immediate environment. He, might, he or she might only have an impact on the immediate community that doesn't make them any less significant or less important. But, the, but it does say something about what activities, what they're talking about, what activities they're engaged in, okay? So can you think of anybody in the, in the ancient history of Judaism, meaning prior to modern Jewish history, who had an impact on the general world? around them, who had an influence. In other words, if you were to ask, let's say you take a professor in a college and you say, have you ever heard of Rashi before? A random professor, a professor in any discipline, not a Jewish religious professor with peyote. I'm talking about a regular person, okay? And you ask them, do you know who's Rashi? What's the likelihood that they're gonna know who Rashi is? Slim, slim, right? If you ask them, who's Rabbeinu Tam? That's the grandson of Rashi, also a very, very significant figure in Ashkenazic tradition. They're not going to know who that is. If you ask them, who is the Rosh? Rabbeinu Asher, very, very significant person also in Sephardic tradition, but it's particularly in Ashkenazi tradition too, they're not going to know who that is. But if you ask somebody on the street, who is Maimonides? Right, who is Maimonides? Even though he lived also in the 1100s, people know who Maimonides is. Non-Jews know who Maimonides is. Any you know, person who is read, well-read in general culture is going to have heard of Maimonides one way or another. Okay, especially if they're studying philosophy or the humanities. They're going to have heard of who Maimonides is. Why is it that they would have heard who Maimonides is, but they wouldn't have heard who Rashi is? Is it because necessarily we think that Maimonides is so much smarter than Rashi? We can't judge who's smarter than whom. What's the reason why? Because Maimonides talked about and wrote about and dealt with issues that were relevant to the entire world. Everybody was interested in that. He wrote about general philosophical issues. What do we know about God? What do we know about the universe? Where did the universe come from? How did it get here? How should a person live their life? Any person. What is the nature of knowledge? How do people come to know things? How can we, can we know the future? Can we not know the future? Is there such a thing as prophecy? How does it work? These are general questions that anybody in any religion or any philosophical tradition is going to care about and be concerned about. People, in, you will open up secular books on ethics, on philosophy, even sometimes on science, and you will see quotations from Maimonides in there. But you will not usually see quotations from Rashi, not because Rashi is less important, but because Rashi doesn't talk about such general issues, general topics. He talks about things that are much more specifically Jewish. 
He talks about the psukim of the Chumash. He talks about Parashat HaShavuah. He talks about the Talmud. He talks about things that are more particularly of Jewish interest. So unless you're a biblical scholar who studies all biblical scholarship and commentaries, you're not going to necessarily know or even have heard of Rashi because he didn't engage with secular culture. Whereas the Sephardic rabbis, as a rule, did. And that's why people like Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi is known outside of the immediate uh, Jewish community. Somebody like Ibn Ezra, that we read, even though he's in the, you think of him as just a character that appears in the Chumash, you know, in the commentaries on the Chumash, is it when you open the book, you see they quote the Ibn Ezra, even the art scroll will quote it in its commentary. Sometimes Ibn Ezra writes this or that. So you think of it as a very Jewish thing, but the fact is that somebody outside of the Jewish community, somebody who studies philosophy, will have heard of, or may have heard of the Ibn Ezra too, because these rabbis made contributions to general culture, they were dealing with things of a general interest. And that's what I mean by more universalism. In other words, they made contributions to the world outside of the immediate Jewish concern. Okay? Does that make sense? You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay? Now, the same is true about issues of science. So, for example, even people of other religions, people of other faiths, okay? Muslim theologians will quote the Rambam. Catholic theologians and philosophers will quote the Rambam. Why are they quoting him? Because he had something to say that was relevant to everyone. But they won't very often quote commentaries that are from the Ashkenazi tradition that focused more on immediately Jewish concerns. Concerns that might not be of any importance to someone who's not Jewish. They're important to us, but they might not be important to people outside. Now, that doesn't make the work of Rashi any less important. And I want to keep emphasizing that because people are telling me I'm a racist and all that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, no, I'm not saying it's less important. I'm saying it's a different focus, right? It's a different focus. That's okay. Not everybody focuses on everything equally. There are some people who are great at one thing and they're not great at another, or they decide to invest their energy. There's an expert on everything. Everything there's an expert on. There are experts on things that are so insignificant you can't believe there's actually an expert on it. Okay, but there are. So saying someone's an expert in Torah doesn't mean that they're anything less. Certainly doesn't mean they're anything less. It just means that their focus is that they focused on the literature of Torah. They didn't go outside that. Okay, and that's, that is true of the Sephardic culture. And, that's, and because of that, and a lot of it, by the way, is historical. You have to realize it's historically based. Because the Sephardic Jews, when we talk about Sephardim, who are we really talking about? We're talking about Jews... Not necessarily they came from Spain, even though that's what Sfaradi means. And now they try to get all technical and they call some people Edot Mizrah. The people who are really Middle Eastern Jews are from the Edot Mizrah, And the people who are Spanish, from a Spanish origin, are called Sfaradim. And then there are some countries that have a mix. But um, like Morocco, for example, had some Jews that were there for a very, very long time. And then the other Jews that came from Spain. And it's, it's a mix. That's not really what we mean when we talk about Sephardic Judaism today. When we talk about Sephardic Judaism, Judaism today, we're talking about a certain tradition that the Jews that came from Spain and the Jews that were located in the Middle East, some of whom, by the way, have, were there for thousands of years, even before the destruction of the Second Temple. Some of the Sephardic Jews were in Syria, were in Iran, were in Iraq since the destruction of the First Temple for a long time. So... These Jews didn't come from Spain, but they shared a common tradition with the Jews that came from Spain. Whereas the Ashkenazi Jews, and around the 8th or 9th century, the Jews that went to Germany and they went to France, began developing their own traditions. Now, remember, people didn't have an easy manner of communication back in the olden days. So the development of traditions, they didn't necessarily have the opportunity to communicate with one another very much. When the Jews were all located in Iraq and the land of Israel during the Talmudic times, it was easy for people to exchange ideas, to share ideas, to communicate, to shape each other's views, and to have a common understanding. But once you have people all across the globe, Jews spreading out across the globe, it's a lot harder to develop one tradition. The rabbis who went to Germany and France developed their own tradition, and the rabbis that stayed in, you know, in, together with the closer to the Middle East, the rabbis that went to Spain, countries, and even Jews, and Jews who lived in Spain, even though Spain was a Catholic country, were actually treated very, very well there until they were all kicked out. But for a long time they were treated really well there. That was the golden age of Spain for the Jews. And the way you can remember it is because in 1492, two very important things happened. One was that Columbus didn't really discover America. 
Columbus came to a place he thought was India, and the Jews were kicked out of Spain. Those are the two important events in our history that happened in 1492. And th up till then, the Jews were treated very, very well in Spain. As opposed to the Jews who were in Catholic countries who were being forced to convert. They were being uh, uh, burned in the, at the stake and all kinds of terrible things. But beyond that, in Christian countries, education wasn't valued. In, in Christian countries at that time, in the Middle Ages, that's why they called the Dark Ages. Because only the clergy was really encouraged to be educated. The common people, not only were they not educated, the priests were afraid of allowing them to be educated. They didn't want the common people to be educated because they thought then they'd actually be able to read the books and find out what they said for real. Instead of just what the priests wanted them to hear was what they said. So imagine a culture in which you're prevented from being educated. People, they don't, they don't want the people to be literate. They don't want the people to be able to access the texts. They were upset when people translated Latin texts into languages people could hear, they could understand. They were upset when the printing press came out and all of a sudden everybody could have a Bible. Now they can open it up and say, hey, the priest said it says such and such in the Bible. I want to see that. What page is it on? And they find out that it's not there. So in Christian countries, Education wasn't promoted even among the, for the Christians themselves, so let alone for the Jews. So it certainly affected their access to general culture. The general culture in the Christian countries was impoverished during the Dark Ages. That's why it's called the Dark Ages. Whereas in the Muslim countries and in Spain, culture was flourishing. Science was flourishing, philosophy was flourishing, poetry was flourishing at that time. It was a really exciting intellectual cultural time. It, just as the Christian countries were sinking into the, uh, or, or were enmeshed in, this, in the Dark Ages, the Muslim countries and Spain were actually really flourishing. And that may very well have contributed to the different attitudes of the Jews towards general culture. First of all, they were accepted and welcomed and their opinions were valued in the Muslim countries and in Spain more than they would have been in France and Germany. And they were exposed to such a rich culture. So that was a tremendous advantage. And they were influenced by that culture and they contributed to that culture. They wrote poetry in Arabic too. When they would hear the beautiful Arabic poetry of the Muslim poets, they would write poetry in Arabic too. And they would say, you know what, we can do it even better in Hebrew. They learned methods of writing poetry from the Arab poets and then they applied it to Hebrew. They improved the Hebrew poetry through learning what was good from what the non-Jews were doing. But that won't work if you're in a society where even what the non-Jews are doing is only for a secret society of priests. And where they shut you out. And there's really no education to speak of. So that's a lot of what happens. So what would happen if you're a Jew and as a Jew, you live in a country where, you, where, where education is banned, basically. There's no general education. There's no secular education. You have no access to books. You have no opportunities for enlightenment or enrichment. But you know from your tradition, from Judaism, that learning is important, right? You know that the Torah tells you learning is important, right? So you're going to want to learn. You're going to want to study. So what are you going to study then? You're going to study Torah. And you're going to invest all your time in studying Torah, all of your intellectual time in studying Torah, because that's the only study that you have. Whereas if you're in Spain, or you're in Iraq, or you're wherever it is, where they have a culture to offer you beyond that, and you can also get a secular education, and you can learn about the sciences, and you can learn about, the, and you can learn about poetry, and you can learn about literature, and there's just so much more around you to, to, uh, to be educated from, you're going to draw from that as well, because you're, and you're going you're gonna to take the best that has to offer and make it a part of your Judaism, and make it a part of your identity, and that's what they did in these countries, because they had the opportunity to do that, and they contributed to it. So this is one of the reasons why the Ashkenazi Jews focused their intellectual energies almost exclusively on things that are not really of general interest, okay? The average person on the street isn't that interested on what Rashi says on the second verse of this week's parasha. But the average person on the street might be interested in the question of whether people have free will or not, or whether God knows the future or not, or whether the universe was created or not or what the soul is, or what the future destiny of the soul is. Anybody would be interested in that. And that's the kind of thing that the Rambam, that Maimonides would be talking about and would be writing about. So 
what this leads to is a very, very interesting thing. A difference in not only what they focused on, what they produced, and what they attached value to. Meaning to say that the Sephardic rabbis, if you look, just to kind of round out the picture, the Sephardic rabbis, if you look at the, the topic of poetry, for example, every great poet of the, of, of the Jewish tradition from the period, uh, from the medieval period, was a Sephardic, made with, except for Khalil. Okay, we don't know exactly when he lived, but, you know, except for Khalil. But even he, we're going to talk about him in a minute. Every great poet, every philosopher that you hear about, every Jewish philosopher was Sephardic until like the 19th or 20th century, where there were some Ashkenazi great thinkers that came. Everyone was Sephardic because the Sephardim were thinking about these big questions. They were talking about these big questions, questions that went beyond just Judaism. Questions that touched on other disciplines and other subjects and science and philosophy and other nations and where the Jewish people fit in with other nations. Much broader questions. So, in fact, there's a funny story. I mentioned it before, but there's a funny story that one of the great luminaries of the Ashkenazi world is Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam was a uh, was a grandson of Rashi. Rashi, the famous Rashi, didn't have any sons, he only had daughters, and one of his daughters had a child named Yaakov, who was known as Rabbeinu Tam. Became known as Rabbeinu Tam. And in one instance, the Ibn Ezra was a very, very famous Sephardic rabbi, but he was an itinerant rabbi. He traveled around because he had a lot of difficulties making a living. He had great difficulty making a living. Every business that he went into failed. He once said, if I went into the funeral business, people would stop dying. <laughs> right? his, his luck was so bad in business, he couldn't make it. So anyway, he would travel around just looking for whatever. And in one instance, he came to visit Rabbeinu Tan. Because he came to France. And um, he visited with him and had an interesting discussion, apparently, which is actually recorded in the commentary of Rabbeinu Tan, the commentary of the Tosafot in, in the Talmud. He mentions that this rabbi, Rabbi Abraham ibn Ezra, came and they discussed this, a particular issue, which I can tell you what it is later. I don't want to go into it right now, but they discussed an issue in Torah where the Ibn Ezra was an expert in the Tanakh, really an expert, probably one of the premier experts that ever lived, and they had a discussion about it, and afterwards they formed like a, a relationship and so Rabbeinu Tam wrote a letter to Ibn Ezra and in the letter he included a poem he had written and he said, listen, I know that you Spanish Jews are the best poets and you know the finest poets and I want to show you a sample of my writing and I also tried to write poetry and what do you think? And basically the Ibn Ezra wrote back to him, don't quit your day job. <laughs> you know? Like, leave it to us, we know what we're doing. So in a nice way, I'm sure, but the point is, that the Svaradim excelled in the art of poetry, they excelled in literature, and this brings us to really the other aspect of the difference between Svaradim and Ashkenazim, and again, we're not bashing one side or the other, we're just explaining what makes Sephardic Judaism unique. The first is the universality of it. The second of it is, the second aspect is the emphasis on Tanakh. And this is something you'll hear actually a lot here at the Beit Midrash probably, and a lot here you know, in our groups, you'll hear a lot of talk about the importance of Tanakh, and that's a good thing. And uh, that was a hallmark, really, of Sephardic Judaism from the beginning. And Ashkenazi Judaism drifted away from the Tanakh. And we'll explain why that is. There's a couple of reasons why that happens. But first of all, just the fact that it's true that Sephardic education always included the entire Tanakh. And it was extremely important that a person know Hebrew well and that they know Hebrew grammar well and they'd be able to read the text according to the literal meaning of the text and then delve into its deeper meaning. That they'd be really textually literate in the Bible, in the Tanakh. And that had a lot of implications, but that was the truth. And the reality is you can find rabbis who are 70, 80 years old, Ashkenazi rabbis, who have literally never read more than the Haftarot for Shabbat. They don't know the Tanakh, they don't know the Navi. Meaning, they know the five books of the Torah. But after that, they only know a smattering of the basic storyline. They don't know the text. And I told the story about uh, when I was a kid and I had a final for Navi, for you know, the prophets. You know, it was uh, probably Sefer Malachim or something. Sefer Malachim, probably. 
And I was really worried that I was going to flunk the test, you know. And at that time, as a kid, I grew up in Ashkenazi shul. I went to Ashkenazi synagogue as a kid. I was even a Baal Kore for Ashkenazim for 10 years. I used to lead the high holiday services for Ashkenazim. I'm pretty well versed in Ashkenazi culture. That's why I felt like comfortable talking about it because I, you know, I grew up Spartic in the house and Ashkenazi in, you know, in public in terms of going to a synagogue that was Ashkenazi and going to Ashkenazi yeshivot. So I'm pretty, you know, I guess I have a, a well-rounded uh, experience of Judaism. And so I called my Ashkenazi rabbi, who was the only rabbi around that. I said, I need help with Sefer Melachim. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'm going to fill the test. He's like, I'm sorry, I don't know the Navi. And the rabbi is like, you know, 50 or 60 years old. And here's a kid, like maybe 15 or 16, learning the Navi in school. And the rabbi is like, even though I've been studying for the past like 30 years, I don't know the Navi. And it was like shocking to me. How could somebody not know that? I remember it being very jarring. But you know, it's not to criticize the rabbi. It's that that was the educational. That was the education he was given. Okay, I'm not blaming that rabbi. That was the education that the rabbi was given. And look at art school. Okay, art school came out with the entire Talmud, but they still haven't come out with the whole Tanakh. They came out with volumes of the Jerusalem Talmud, which is pretty obscure, and they still haven't finished the Tanakh. That's a little bit strange. Okay, they finished the, the one volume Tanakh, but I'm talking about like with the commentary. They didn't, they didn't come out with the whole Tanakh yet. So it just shows you the priority. What is the Tanakh? The Tanakh is the Bible. That's the original text. The Talmud is the commentaries on it and the explanations of it. They came from the, you know, came from the oral tradition. But the foundation, the bedrock is the Tanakh. And in the Ashkenazi communities, it wasn't highly valued. In fact, what ended up happening was, not only was it not the, the emphasis, but the reform movement actually did a great, even a further disservice. Because what happened was that when reform started and when the Enlightenment came to Europe, all of the enlightened secularists said, ah, what do we need this Talmud for? This Talmud is a bunch of rabbis arguing about things, and we don't need that commentary of the rabbis. We need the Bible. We want to go back to the original source. We want to go back to the Tanakh, to the original Bible, and we don't need the, uh, we don't need the Talmud. And that's exactly what Ben-Gurion did, by the way. Why is there a Chidona Tanakh? You know, the, the emphasis on Tanakh that Ben-Gurion wanted to have in, in, in the education in the state of Israel wasn't because he was Sfaradi. He wasn't, right? It wasn't because he wanted the most authentic Torah education for people. It was because he felt that the Bible was closer to the heart of Jewish culture and would be the right text to build a state on as opposed to the Talmud, which he associated with the ghettos of Europe. He associated the Talmud with ghetto Judaism, from which many of them escaped. Now, <coughs> this lack of emphasis, or this lack of awareness of Tanakh, versus the strong awareness of Tanakh among the Sfaradim, leads to a lot of different results. One of them is that the Tanakh is, the Tanakh is like, I, I hate to use this term, like, but it's the best term. It's more real. I know people don't understand what I mean when I say real, but it's concrete. The Tanakh is full of stories. The Tanakh is full of history. The Tanakh is full of real human beings doing real stuff and engaging in real problems and having to overcome them. Even books like Proverbs, Mishlei, the Proverbs are based on real life experience and how to deal with real life experience. It's very close to the ground, the Tanakh. It's very close to the ground. Of course, there are some parts of the Tanakh that are very lofty, very high level poetry, or very philosophical passages in the Tanakh, of course. But it's something that can speak to anybody. You read the Tanakh, it can speak to anybody. It's universal. The Talmud was the advanced study, the very abstract study of the Talmud. Now, what ended up happening was, so because the Reform Movement and the Enlightenment made the Tanakh their centerpiece, that made the religious Jews even more nervous about studying it. Because anybody catches you reading the Tanakh, they're going to think you are a heretic now because you're reading the thing that all the Reformed Jews are reading and all the Enlightenment people, the secular people are reading. They didn't want to be caught dead with that. So it also suffered from that. As a result of the Enlightenment, people stopped reading the Tanakh. So there were a couple of reasons historically why the Tanakh fell out of favor. But what's more important, to, what's more significant for us to understand is culturally what's the effect of that. The effect of that is a Judaism that isn't as rooted in the here and now. That is, a, that is more abstract. It's more of a book-based Judaism and more of an academic Judaism. What I mean is that the Talmud 
thinks about things in a very abstract, legalistic kind of way. That's what the Talmud is. The Talmud is a book of laws, discussion of laws, theory, analysis. It's very advanced thought. This version of Judaism is not the Judaism for the average person. Right? It's not the Judaism that immediately strikes your, the heart of your experience, your life experience. It's very, it's very abstract. That's why not everybody is into Talmud. A lot of people find it over their heads. If a person has a choice of going to hear a great shiur, a great class on the parasha of the week, or a story of Tanakh versus a Talmud class, 99% of people are going to go to the story of Tanakh. Because it's something palpable, it's something concrete, it's something everybody can relate to. But that also leads to a type of Judaism that's more relatable. It means that the, their, their concept of Judaism was based on more concrete connection than the Talmudic concept of Judaism. And this is going to lead us to something else. But that the idea is that for the Sephardim, since they viewed Torah as part of a general understanding of the world, they had a bigger, they were dealing with bigger things beyond the immediate of Torah. They were looking to integrate the Torah with bigger things. Whereas for the Ashkenazim, they found their entire intellectual satisfaction in Torah because they were cut off from all of those other things. They didn't have those other things available to them. So what did they focus on? They focused on the Talmud because the Talmud was advanced study. That was the only advanced study that they had. So they focused all of their energy in that. Because if you don't have any intellectual outlet, you're not given a secular education, you're not given any other topics to think about, you're not involved in, let's say, the philosophical thinking of the Rambam. So the highest intellectual activity you have is the Talmud. And that was where the Ashkenazim were. So what ended up happening was that the Ashkenazim, if you look at the commentaries, it's very interesting, if you look at the commentaries, open up a Chumash, or open up a Navi. If you look at the commentaries in there, you will see that almost all of the commentaries in the Tanakh are by Sfaradim, except for Rashi. Almost all of them are by Sfaradim. Ibn Ezra, Seforno, we count him, he's Italian. <laughs> Seforno, Ibn Ezra, Ramban, Radak, and then, you know, Abarbanel, all of these are Sfaradim. If you look at the Talmud, most of the commentaries on the Talmud, the popular ones, Ashkenazim. Rashi, Tosafot. The commentaries on the Talmud are almost exclusively from Ashkenazi sources. And part of the reason for this is because there was a very different, and this is an interesting historical phenomenon. In the Sephardic community, there was always a trend towards simplifying the halakha. So how did that happen? So the Talmud, if you've ever studied it, it's really very vast. Very vast. And it is like one long run-on conversation that goes from topic to topic with no clear beginning, middle, and end sometimes. It can go from subject to subject and be all over the place. It's very difficult to follow. If you wanted to give somebody a book to introduce them to Judaism, you wouldn't give them a Talmud. They wouldn't know where to start, where to end. It's, it's, it, would, it would take them on a roller coaster ride. They wouldn't be able to find any bears. Not to mention that even in terms of observing the laws of Judaism, it's not clear what the conclusions are in the Talmud, how to apply them. So much discussion came after the Talmud in terms of how to apply it. What happened was there was a rabbi in the 10th century by the name of Rabbi Yitzchak al Fasi, who said, it's too, the Talmud is too much. Even for scholars, it's too much, let alone for the average person. I am going to write the Cliff's Notes on the Talmud. You know what Cliff's Notes are, right? You never use them, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Spark Notes, right? Yeah. So now you can get them online, all those things for free. You don't even need to buy, to buy them anymore. So the people say, so he said, <coughs> it's too much, so I'm going to make the simple version, the Cliff's Notes version of the Talmud. You open it up, it gives you like the conclusions right away. You don't have to go through the whole back and forth. Go, you don't get lost in it. It's very direct. It's very to the point. And it's going to be, you know, easier for people to get through than the whole long Talmud. And it will make clear what is the ruling at the end. So the Rift did this. And of course it was a little bit controversial because people don't like anybody meddling with the text, but it was accepted. What was the goal of the Rift? What was his goal? His goal was to simplify things, right? His goal was to downsize. To say there's too much material, we need to downsize. So what did the people do as a, as a thank you to him? They wrote a hundred commentaries on it. <laughs> So now you can't read it without reading 100 commentaries, so it kind of defeated the purpose. 
Fast forward a couple of generations, you come to the Rambam, the famous Rambam. What did he do? He said, I like what the Rift did, it was good. But there's only a pro one problem. It's still not enough, still not enough. What we need to do is not follow the order that the Talmud has, which is still a winding order, but we have to make a textbook that stands independent of the Talmud. That anybody can pick up this textbook, even without looking at the Talmud, and page one says, what is the most important thing in Judaism? Okay, believing that there's a God, and believing such and such about Hashem, and believing this, and then what's the second most important thing, what's the third most important thing? It will follow the order of the importance of topics and themes, and in each theme, all of the laws that are relevant to that theme will be organized perfectly, just like a textbook would be organized. Not based on free association. If you open up the Talmud, it's in the middle of talking about reading the Shema. It doesn't tell you what is Judaism, what is God, any, any basic. It doesn't even tell you that there's a mitzvah to read the Shema. It just starts talking about when to read it. So you have a book that is designed for experts already, for people who already know, have a background already. It's not a textbook. It's an advanced book, the Talmud. The Rambam says, I want to make something that any person can pick up and read it and understand it and study it and get what is Judaism about, what are all the laws of Judaism. Of course, if there's too complicated of a question, they're still going to have to ask an expert, but it will be basically a self-contained Jewish education. Why do I want to do this? Because people are getting lost. Even with the Rif's code, people are getting lost. There's too much. People don't understand the language of the Talmud. People don't understand the reasoning. It's overwhelming. We need to cut it down. That's what the Rambam said. That, how, did, how well did that work out? All right, so now how many commentaries are there on the Rambam now? I don't know, thousand? Right? They don't work. You look at the, now they're trying to bring back the pure Rambams that only have the Rambam text, but for a long time you had to read it with so much commentary around it. There was one line of the Rambam, sometimes no lines of the Rambam, because the commentary was so long that it went on more pages. And the Rambam comes back after a few pages. Right? So it, it, they didn't exactly follow his program. His program was, I want to make this as simple as possible. Fast forward a little bit more, there was a great rabbi by the name of the Rosh. He was actually an Ashkenazi rabbi, but he served as the rabbi of a Sephardic community in Toledo. And he uh, also tried to make a digest of the Talmud. His son wrote a book called The Tour, which was also an attempt to synthesize and digest all of the different opinions and make the Jewish law streamlined so people wouldn't have to wade through a million texts to get to the bottom line. And then, eventually came in the 16th century what we know today as the Shulchan Aruch that everyone's heard of, Maran the Beit Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who again, sifted through all of the previous material and said, I'm finally going to give you the bottom line on everything and there won't have to be any more discussion and then we'll be done with all of this discussion about these different halachot because I am going to be the last word on it and nobody except for the 5,000 commentaries that are going to come after me will have anything to say in it. <laughs> right, because that's what ended up happening. How many commentaries are on the Shulchan They're still printing commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch now. Really, all the time. It's incredible. So, and all of these rabbis were trying to simplify things. Now, why is it that they wanted to simplify things? Well, if you believe something is a means to an end, you want it to be as efficient as possible. You don't want it to go on forever. You want it to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You want it to have limits. If you believe something is an end in itself, then you might think that it makes sense to do it endlessly. Now for the Sephardic rabbis, or the Sephardic Jews, one of the things that they believed very deeply was that halakha, the Jewish law, is one part of being a Jew. But ultimately, being a Jew is a lot more than that. Halakha is, a, is the means to an end of serving Hashem, but serving Hashem has so much more to it than that. There's many more things that are not tangible, that are not quantifiable, that can't just be reduced to a halakha. Okay, there's more to it. So with that idea in mind, they said we don't want people to spend all of their time and energy quibbling over every single detail of every halakha. We want them to have a clear answer and be done. Because if they get caught up in those details, they're not focusing on the ultimate. The ultimate is understanding Hashem, Hashem's ways. And really, what is the ultimate ultimate? Where do you ultimately find Hashem's ways? In the Tanakh, actually. Which is why, going back, we're circling back a little bit, why the Svaradim recognized or appreciated the Tanakh as the core of everything. Because they said that's where you get to what are Hashem's ways, how do we get closer to Hashem, what is the ultimate knowledge of Hashem. All of the halachot are to train you, to make you into a kind of person that can get close to Hashem. But if you just become a guy, it's like if a person goes to every script, every practice, and goes through every drill, but doesn't show up at the game. And what was the point of all of it, right? What was the point? 
You never went to the gate. Or as the Rabbam in his very, very famous metaphor that he gives at the end of the Guide for the Perplexed, he says people who only study the halakha are like a person who comes to the king's palace, walks around and around the palace, but never walks in the door. He wants to see the king, but he comes to the palace, and instead of walking in the front door, he just keeps going around and around and around. He says that's a person who only studies halakha. Because he's just studying the way to become a person who can meet the king, but he doesn't encounter the king, which is the next level. So for a person to be able to do that, they have to have a sense that there's a next level that they can jump to. And that was why you see something very interesting, and that's what I wrote here in, what, uh, uh, in the notes there, that you can, you can see why both the Kabbalistic rabbis and the non kabbalists we always talk about this ridiculous uh, uh, distinction of the rationalist and Kabbalist. I reject that. I don't believe that it's a valid distinction. Ka Kabbalists are also rational. There's no, it's not irrationalist versus rationalist. It's a silly distinction, but substantively speaking, whether you believe in a mystical tradition, let's say, of understanding the deeper secrets of Torah, or you believe, like the Rambam does, that the human intellect can discover the secrets of Torah without a mystical tradition, whatever you believe, that's really the difference between the Kabbalists and the non-Kabbalists. It's the only difference. Everybody agrees you have to use your brain and your mind to figure it out. It's just a question of whether you need a tradition or not. Whatever you believe, the assumption of both Kabbalah and philosophy, let's call it, the assumption of both is that there's some higher meaning to Judaism beyond just doing the mitzvot. There's some higher meaning, there's some higher purpose. And that's why pretty much all the philosophers and Kabbalists of Jewish tradition were Sfaradim. Because they were the ones who were seeking, they said, Halakha is good to get you to a certain level, but then you have to leap into the ultimate. What's the ultimate? I've often quoted the Rabbam, he writes to one of his students, he says, his student asked him, how can I attain perfection? I think this was to Ibn Aknin, actually. That how can I attain true perfection? And he said, you know what you need to do? For the first few years, just pay attention during the tefillah. For a few years. For a few years, just pay attention to what you're saying when you're praying. That's step one, then call me after that. After you've done that for a few years and pay attention to the Torah when it's being read, and then, then you'll be ready for the next level. He's talking to his most advanced students and saying, you know what the next thing you need to do to become more developed, you need to just pay attention. Meaning that even a student wasn't paying attention. Even the person who might be very, very scholarly isn't paying attention. So that just shows you there's something more than just the technical act in, in, in observing Judaism. And this is what I call, you know, um, and if, if you're following the sheet here, that's why I talk about the experiential or holistic religion, okay? Meaning, I, I had, a, um, I had a, a friend who told me, his mother, his mother said, he, he quoted to me a quote from his mom. His mom said to him, this was a Sephardic Jew, he said to me, my mom always said, Sephardim, he said, Ashkenazim are religious on purpose. But, but Sephardim are religious by nature. Huh? Ashkenazim, they're religious on purpose. And there's some truth to that. People who come from Ashkenazi backgrounds to Sephardic communities, a lot of times say, how come people are very laid back? Right? And if you go into Ashkenazi communities, sometimes you have a sense of the very rigid, there's a more rigid observance of halakha in, in those contexts. And part of the reason is because as, a, as, a, uh, as an approach to Judaism that's very much based on the Talmud more than the Tanakh, based on technical formulas. It's based on technical formulas and reasoning a lot more than on an organic kind of reasoning, a natural kind of reasoning that the, uh, that the Sfaradim would use. And so for instance, and I, I, I jotted down a few of the examples here so you can remember them later, a couple of good examples. One of them is the famous example of the olive, which you know many of you might already be familiar with, which is that the, the halakha is that, let's say on Pesach, you have to eat an olive's worth of matzah. Kazai. Kazai means an olive. But you will find that many people will take a sheet out that's like as big as a, this big, right? And then they take the matzah, and they put the matzah onto the sheet, and they measure it like that, and they measure like an entire matzah, or half or three quarters of a matzah from the sheet. Now, has ever, anyone ever seen an olive that big? Maybe like a genetically engineered olive that was like, <laughs> would kill you. It, you know, that, that huge olive, 
Okay? That type of model doesn't exist, but they did that. Now, why did they do that? It's remarkable why they did that. They did that because the Ashkenazim historically had never seen olives before. So what do you do if you've never seen an olive? They didn't have olives in France and Germany at that time. I'm sure they probably import them now. They didn't have them. So what did they, what did they do? What do you do if you don't know? You look in the book, you look in the Talmud, the Talmud talks about what is the size of an olive relative to an egg. Is it a third of one? It says, is it less than a third? Is it less than a half? Different, different views. But at the end of the day, what are they using? They're using a book. In other words, they're trying to figure out a natural phenomenon from reading a book. Now, they might not have been able to do any better than that. They, they didn't have any other alternative. But they said, okay, so it's about a third of the size of an egg. Or it's about a half of the size of an egg. Is that a realistic estimate for the size of an olive? Again, not any olive that you, probably any of us have ever seen. But that was the best that they could do because they knew that the Talmud said that the olive was less than the egg by a certain proportion. And so they had to guesstimate, okay, well, to err on the side of caution, we're going to say it's as close to the size of half an egg as possible. And since we're not exactly sure what kind of eggs they were working with, you know, maybe we have to err on the side of caution on that one too. So what ends up happening is they have an enormous olive. But that's because you never saw an olive. Now, if you walk into, uh, if you're living in Eretz Israel, or you're living in the Middle East, and you want to know how much matzah, you go and look at an olive hanging on the tree, you take off the olive, you see how much matzah it is, and you eat it. That's a very different, and in fact, what's the, the Rishonim say? What was the whole reason why the Torah gave us measurements like olive and pomegranate and all that for different halachot? It was because those were readily available to the people living in Israel. They would easily be able to follow the halachot. Not so they could make a sheet that they print out on the computer that they measure the matzah. That wasn't the reason. Or I'll give you another example. Mezuzah is a good example. Now, many people are familiar with the slanted mezuzah, right? The slanted mezuzah is a good example of the difference between the general Ashkenazi view of halakha and the Sephardic view. Do you know why the mezuzah is slanted? That's not the reason. They put it flat, actually. I've heard that before. That's like a nice, like a, dra a drush, as they say. But but the real tr answer is what I don't remember what that. But yeah, yeah. So there's there's really a there's really a disagreement among the rabbis about what the correct mezuzah is supposed to be. Right. So there's one view that says it's supposed to be horizontal, which we never have seen. You know, Rabbi Tam, he says it's supposed to be horizontal, like this way. Nobody's ever seen a mezuzah like this way, right? Or according to well, according to some, the Rabbam and others, and Rashi, it has to be like this, straight up and down, vertical. Okay, vertical mezuzah. So what happened was that they said, listen, I say that it has to be vertical, you know, in other words, and, and if, it's, if it's horizontal, it's no good. The other said, I said, I said it has to be horizontal. If it's vertical, it's no good. So what they came up with is a compromise. They said, listen, we want to make everybody happy. So you know what we're going to do? Let's make it on horizontal. Let's make it a diagonal. That way, according to the guy that says it's vertical, he'll still be satisfied. Uh, he doesn't like it so much. It's a little bit slanted, but it's close enough. And according to the one that says it be horizontal, he says, okay, well, at least it's not vertical. So basically, you have a compromise. But what ends up happening? What ends up happening? That's why it's slanted like that. Now, what, what, what ends up happening when you have that? What ends up happening? It's not according to anybody. <laughs> so, so the mezuzah that you see that's slanted on the door is not what anybody says the mezuzah is supposed to look like. Literally, nobody says the mezuzah is supposed to look like that. Not, not Rashi, not Rabbi Yotan, not Rambam, nobody. That's what you end up with when you... What, so, but what is the reason? Because when you're thinking in what I call a mathematical mode, a technical mode, when it's very abstract, it's all formulas. So you say, oh, how many variables can I satisfy in the equation? Well, if I pick A, then it's not going to satisfy C. If I pick C, it's not going to satisfy A. But if I pick B, which is in the middle, it kind of satisfies both, but it's neither one of them. Right? It's almost like a technical way of thinking, right? So that way of thinking produces things like slanted mezuzot. Same thing as with tefillin, according to the Taz. You know, it's very technical, I don't want to get into it, but that's another example. There are many examples of this in halakha, and it's typical of Sephardic poskim that they don't do that kind of thing. They take one of, when there are two incommensurate views, they say, listen, it has to make sense according to someone. It has to be somebody. So there are times where we can satisfy every view. I'll give you an example, a simple example. 
There are disagreements about the spacing of paragraphs in the Torah, how it's supposed to be done. I'm not going to go into the details. There are disagreements about it. Now, it happens to be that you can write an entire Sefer Torah in a way that everybody would be happy. But a tef tefillin, you can't. There's no way to write tefillin that both sides of the debate are going to be happy. So what did Ashkenazim do? They came up with a way that they think that it satisfies, it really doesn't fit either one, right? But it doesn't, but, and it's, it's very complicated. But for Sfaradim, the Bet Yosef, the Shukhan Aruch says, listen, this is a case where we have to choose between one, so we choose one. Right, sometimes you have to choose. Why? Because it's more important that your Judaism look like the Judaism of somebody than that it fulfill a technical formula that it actually look like the way that Judaism was envisioned because there's a sense in Sephardic Judaism more of a vision of Judaism, a sense of what it's supposed to look like, what it's supposed to be experienced like. And that's as opposed to the technical kind of approach to Judaism that also leads to a lot of rigidity in observance because everything has to be according to a formula. It doesn't come out naturally because everything is trying to live according to an abstract formula. Whereas in, in the Sephardic view, we want it to be something organic, something that fits, something that flows with life. And this is connected to the general attitude of Sephardim. That they're, in, again, the Tanakh-based attitude of Sephardim, it all, it's all integrated. The fact that our religion is rooted in the Tanakh. It's rooted in literature, it's rooted in stories about real people, real experience, and real life. We, we are the authors of poetry. Poetry is something that evokes real experience and emotion. It touches a person on every level, not just the abstract level. We're not dissing the abstract. The abstract is good. We're not dissing the Talmud. The Talmud is good. It, it, all of these things are important. It's just a question of ultimately, do you escape from the real world into the world of, ma uh, of formulas? Or do you take the ideas of halakha and integrate them into the real world? so that they're lived as a real way of living, not as something you're doing on purpose. Like you're doing something that doesn't come naturally, that doesn't feel natural. It's not natural to put a mezuzah on a slant, based on what the concept of a mezuzah is. That doesn't, that's not the idea of anybody. Okay, so that, that concept is an important one. I just wanna start to wrap up quickly with, I'll give you an interesting story, first of all. One way you can see the difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazic Judaism, two funny stories. One is, is in the music, that if you look at the uh, Shirei Shabbat, if you look at the songs, Shabbat songs, of Sephardim and Ashkenazim, there's, some, there's a very interesting pattern, which is the spiritual songs of Shabbat, Ki Yeshmer HaShabbat, Tzameh Anafshi, all of these very inspiring spiritual songs, they're all written by Sephardim. The Ashkenazi songs, they mostly talk about food. <laughs> and any song on Shabbat that talks about the menu, Lehetaneg Beta'anugim, Barburim, Muslav Betagim, all these things that lists what's for dinner, lists what's for lunch, Ashkenazi songs. Why is that? I don't know the answer. It's just an interesting thing. <laughs> you know, that, that I don't know the answer. But, it, but more, more pertinent than that is sometimes you can tell the difference between uh, between the, sort of the, the mentality of rabbis based on what the, and I didn't mention this in the shir, so this is going to be different. I mentioned this in Congress when I spoke in Congress about this. The, um, so when, in, uh, in, uh, when one thing you can see from, from uh, you know, to, to tell the difference in the attitude is if you look in responsa literature, you open up the books of answers to questions that rabbis gave. Okay? So if you look at two random Ashkenazi sets of responsa by two different rabbis, what is the first letter they're going to put? It kind of defines the tone of the whole work, right? Because they don't write them in chronological order. Let's say they're asked hundreds of questions, so they put them in a book, right? What, what do they want to be first? They want their, the most important thing first, right? What do they think is the most important? I'm not going to mention the names of the rabbis because I'm not here to bash anybody, but one of them, one very famous series of responsa, and one, you guys are all going to go look and you're going to find out what it is, and it's okay. One very famous one, we have it here, starts with the question of how big does your kippah have to be? How exactly big does your kippah have to be? In order to, be full, to fulfill having a kippah. Now, how, that, that was the, the exact measurement of kippah. 
Now, I'm not saying Akiva is not important. I'm just saying that that is what the person, what this rabbi put as the number one response in his collection. Another one, which I don't think we have this one here, but I have it on my show you, is how long does a girl's skirt have to be? Does it have to be to her knee or to her ankle? Very, these are very profound questions. Now, there, on the other hand, there's, there's a, uh, a, a set of responsa by a great Moroccan rabbi, Rabbi Massas, Rabbi Yosef Massas. It's called Mayim Chayim. You know what the first, I love this, this is the best response. We have to all go study this one. It's a very good one. I wish they would translate it into English. His first response is, you shouldn't stay up so late learning Torah at night. You need a good night's sleep. <laughs> That's what he talks about. He says it's very important to get sleep at night. So he said during the summer, no learning. You need to go to bed. During the winter when the nights are long, you can learn for the amount of time that's different between the summer night and the winter night only. And you shouldn't learn hard stuff at night because you're tired. You should learn easy stuff. And he's battling all these sources. They're bringing, what do you mean? You're supposed to learn at night. It's so important. He says, yeah, but he, he gives answers. He says, ultimately, a person's health is very important. You need your health. So it, it just shows you a holistic view that the first response of his collection is about how a person has to be balanced, basically. How a person has to balance the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, all these things have to be balanced. And that comes from a person who is living Judaism as something organic and real and experiential. Something that's a part of who they are, not something that's a technical formula that they follow. And so um, th that, in a way, exemplifies, I think, in a, very clearly, the difference between these two, uh, the difference between the two approaches. But I do, I don't want to go on to the end. Of, I have like a couple more things on here that I'd love to talk about, but I do want to give you guys an opportunity to ask questions, as John said. We did make that part of it. So if anybody has questions before we conclude, please feel free to bring them up. Yes? What exactly is the divide between Sparty and how or why did it happen? <clears throat> well, it had a lot to do with geography. And it happened, you know, it's hard to, I wouldn't say that there's like a point in time, like a day that, you know, it happened, but sometime in the 8th or 9th century when, uh, when communities started migrating, a lot of it had to do with geography, that the Jews started to migrate. So the Jews that were in North Africa or in the Middle East, closer to the original center of uh, Jewish life, and had greater access to it and had freer flow of traffic, with the original sources of Jewish uh, culture, and let's say in Babylonia and, uh, and Israel, were what we call the Sephardim. And the ones who ended up in Germany or they ended up in France, they ended up further away and in different cultures and not with such easy passage back, kind of developed their own traditions and what we call Ashkenazi. Why did any differences come about? What? Why did any differences come about? Well, I think that a lot of it had to do with what we said in the beginning, that being isolated and being in a culture where what's emphasized is really not engagement with intellectual matters at all. So people really took refuge in the Jewish intellectualism, and the Jewish intellectualism was Talmud alone. They weren't exposed to broader uh, intellectual horizons, so they kind of limited their focus to the, to the Talmud, and they made more Talmud, basically, because that was all they had. They wrote commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries in Talmud, because that was their greatest output of intellectual uh, uh, you know, uh, worth. And it's not to denigrate it, that what they put out was very valuable. The, the, the commentaries that they put out were very valuable. We don't want to say that they were not worthwhile. They were very worthwhile. It was just that what pushed them into that focus was that they didn't have these other things to focus on. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Did you say that the fact that the Sephardim didn't have a reform movement, was that because they were focused in easier, people had an easier time keeping it than they did in the Ashkenazi world? Like, can, you, can, you, can, you say, can you give a reason for that? that, that can you explain why we didn't have a reform movement the Ashkenazi did? Well, I mean, part of the reform movement had to do with the Enlightenment that happened in Europe. And it didn't happen to the Jews that were living in the Sephardic countries. So that had a lot to do with the, the reform movement not happening. A lot of it had to do with that. But I think a lot of it also had to do with, and this is what, why, why somebody like Rev Hirsch uh, was the, uh, tried to fight the uh, reform, was because the truth is, and, this, and, and incidentally, the Hasidic movement is the same thing. You know, somebody pointed out in the, one, of the com one of the comments on that YouTube video that was more 
constructive. That, you know, chasidut is also an example of thinking about a bigger picture. And that part of the problem that chasidut came to respond to was that people felt the deadening effect of a very legalistic Judaism. And that there wasn't any bigger picture, there wasn't any greater purpose to it, it was just routine. And so what happened was, when you come to the Enlightenment, and all of a sudden the Enlightenment happens, and you're, you're encountering all these big ideas that you've never encountered before, and you're not in touch with that tradition that already absorbs that kind of thinking, but you have a very kind of ghettoized Judaism that's cut off from that kind of thinking, there you have different responses. One response is to give up the Judaism and to go for the Enlightenment. Another response is to close in even more, or to produce your own alternative to it. And an alternative to it might be Chassidut, Another alternative to it was the Lithuanian Tal Talmudists, basically. The Lithuanian Talmudists of the Brisk tradition said, we can do intellectual better than they can. We'll do it in Talmud. They, they do it in their philosophy, we'll do it in Talmud. Because that's what we know best. And so that was their response to it. So I think that reform happened, yeah, because of a opening up of this Pandora's box of intellectual exposure that the Sephardim were already desensitized or prepared for it. They were already prepared for it. So they, they weren't affected, even even when it did come to them, they weren't affected. Any other questions? Yes. Do you think that most of these like uh, differences still hold true today? I think so. I think most of them do. I think that uh, it's a lot of it is embedded in the culture. One of the one of the disadvantages that we do have is that um, is that a lot of the education being provided to our kids is by Ashkenazi rabbis and Ashkenazi institutions. And many of those institutions, with some exceptions, to be fair, with some exceptions of those who are going back to the Tanakh, there, you know, one of the beautiful things about the rebirth of the State of Israel was that it brought back a lot of emphasis to study of Tanakh. There was a big movement towards the study of Tanakh, even among the Ashkenazim. And so that kind of has infiltrated the modern Orthodox world a great deal. And I think it's trickled down to some of the Ashkenazi institutions in a positive way, uh, that it's, you know, that, that emphasis is there. That they are, uh, that, that they're bringing it, but there's definitely that problem that our children, the children of the, you know, the Sfaradim, are being educated in institutions that might not be totally on par, on, you know, the same page with these values. I'll give you an example. You know, I was at, I'm not going to mention names, but I was at a certain school. They were talking about the curriculum, and they said, oh, you know, we don't teach the Navi too much. We focus on the Mishnah. So we just kind of tell them the story of the Navi. We don't really read it. We, we don't focus on it too much. And I was like, what are you talking about? That's, that's strange. Why not? <laughs> Why can't you just read it? But they, you know, there, there's something like very much a part of the culture that Navi, ah, oh, they'll learn it in the future. They'll learn it on their own. We don't have to teach them. Even though you know that's not true. They don't really do it. Unless they make a concerted effort, you know? So why spend the time on Mishnah? They could also learn the Mishnah on their own. Why can't we teach them the Nabi? So, you know, that's, it's, there's still issues that need to be overcome. There's a famous story about, you know, to quote a, a, a good, uh, uh, you know, Ashkenazi rabbi, the Maharal, the famous Maharal story. That, you know, he was a very big opponent of the way that they skipped the Tanakh. That was a, that was a big thing for him in the Gra also. The Vilna Gaon was a big opponent of the fact that people don't focus on the Tanakh enough in the Ashkenazi education, but they didn't have much influence. They really tried to, to fight against the, the, the neglect of Tanakh. And I think that that makes a big difference when you, and, and what is it that, why is it, just to put it in perspective for a second, why is it that in Israel there was a rebirth of, the, of, of Tanakh? Because, because there's a, because the, the Talmudic Judaism is a, I'm not, I'm not saying the Talmud is not important, I don't mean that, but like a, a, a Judaism that is only focused on Talmud is a Judaism that doesn't feel at home in the place that it is. It's big, so uh, the, the Judaism of Tanakh, because it's about real places and people and governments and societies and social life that's Jewish, it fits so perfectly with a Jewish state and a Jewish government, which may or may not be good. Like you walk in Israel and in the state of Israel, and yeah, the state of Israel is not perfect and the government of Israel is not perfect, but there were lots of imperfect governments in the Tanakh. And they were still Jewish, and they still had a Jewish state, and Jewish governance, even though it was flawed. So all of these things, or Jewish armies, that was part of the big thing. You know, they liked the idea that the Jew of the Tanakh is a mighty Jew, 
He's a warrior Jew. He goes to war. He goes as a soldier. They like that. The Jews of the Talmud are rabbis who sit around desks and talk about all kinds of halachot, and they're not, you know, they don't go to the army, you know. That was like the Jew that they think of the ghetto Jews. I'm saying that was the perception that they had. I'm not saying it's true. But the Jews of the ghetto, they escaped from their ghetto life in the world of the Talmud, in this idealized world of the Talmud. Whereas the world of the Tanakh is very real. That's why it bothers us so much. Because we're so used to this idyllic kind of Judaism that when we read about David HaMelech having an affair with Bathsheba, we say, oh my God, I can't even think about that. Why, who would do that? Really? Have you read the news? Really? Are you awake? Are you aware of what's going on? That's really that shocking? It's only shocking because you're in, the, in an abstract world where everything is perfect. But in the real world, those things happen. But when we see them happen in the Tanakh, because we're not used to it, I remember I took, a, I took one semester in Turo College. One semester only. <laughs> I also I also took a few semesters in the Catholic University. I was more proud of that. <laughs> in, in 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 Turo College, a lot of the guys really didn't have a very strong secular education, and 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 they were there because you got yeshiva credit, and that's kind of the reason I went. But then I never reported it on my transcript. I just wanted it to disappear. <laughs> I decided I, I, I decided I would do an extra semester. So. <laughs> Sorry, Toro, if you're watching this video. Um, uh, anyway, in, 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 so, so what I did was, so, so one of the classes, one of the classes, we read a book, a, some story, I don't know, it was an English class, read some story. It was about, it made an illusion. It didn't even mention it. It talked about a guy and a girl that they met each other and they went back to the guy's house. Didn't even say what they did. It was implicit, you know? They went back and spent the night. This religious guy was, oh my God. What is this disgusting thing that you're making us read? What is, how could you make us read this is a Jewish institution? It didn't even say anything in it. Have you read the Torah? <laughs> Have you read the Navi? There's way worse things in there, but I guess he never read it. I mean, it, it, it was, there's, an, there's an idea that, you know, when you're working in the area of halakha, it's very abstract. Everything's very abstract. You don't even hardly think about what you're, what you're talking about because everything is a formula. Everything is a, is, a, is a concept. Whereas when you're reading a Tanakh, it's so raw that a lot of times people, even there, they find refuge in, let's say, Midrashim and things that make the stories more comfortable, more palatable in a way, because the actual story is so jarring and so shocking. But that's part of the greatness of it. The people are real, right? Who are the most real people in the Torah, in the Tanakh? Yaakov Avinu is very real. He deals with every problem. Kid problem, parent problem, kid problems, wife problems, business problems, father-in-law problems, everything. Right? Everything. He's the most real. David Amela, very real person. You can relate to somebody like that. Abraham Avinu, he's like larger than life. Right? It's, he's too great to be real. He's real, but he's so great that it's like he's almost a legendary, a legend in his own time. But Yaakov Avinu, you can really feel it. So then everyone gets, oh, how could he lie? How could he do this? How did he say, I need Esav, I'm Esav. He's not telling the truth. He lied because he lied. Because people lie. Right? It's, it's to teach you something, but the fact is, like, you have to start out with reading the story. The story is, he lied. Now where do we go from there? Was it the right thing to do? Was it the wrong thing? Why did he do it? But... That kind of engaging with the reality of the text is what Sfaradim did. So you'll see that the Sephardic commentators are very much in favor of the simple meaning of a text. They want you to first see the simple meaning of the text before you go beyond that. Because that's what connects you to the real story. And you can feel it. If I were Yaakov, how would I feel that my dad was doing this? How would I feel that my mom was doing this? How would I feel that my kids were doing this? You need to be able to experience it and then apply the lessons that you learned to your life. Because there's no book of halachot of how to deal with your kids. Did you know, this is a very interesting thing, I'll, I'll conclude with this, but this doesn't really have anything directly to do with Sephardic, but it, it, in a way it does. That when, when, you know there's a book called Shmirat HaLashon. Say for Shmirat HaLashon. The book of guarding your tongue, it means not saying Lashon Hara. Written by the Chavetz So, it's a well-known thing that Harav Yisrael Salanter would not write 
an approbation for that book. You know, a lot of times what they would do was they would go ask bigger rabbis, famous rabbis, could you please write a like a, a certification of my book that it's good? Like if you come out with a book even today, you get like these letters in the front that I say that, you know, so and so is a good rabbi and all that. This rap that Rabbi Sosanta wouldn't write an approbation for the Shmirat Lashon. He said because guarding your tongue from Lashon Hara is not something that you have technical laws about. It's a, it's, a, it's a character trait that you, you have to internalize. You can't write a rule book on doing it. Nobody's going to open up a rule book and decide every word that they say. They're having a conversation. Wait a second. What do I do? It can't work like that. It has to be something that's a part of you. It has to be something that you internalize. And that's a lot of what, the, what Sephardic Judaism is about. Is it obviously observing halakha, but making it a part of you. Making it something real to you. And um, there are, were a couple more points I wanted to get to, but I don't want to keep everybody too late. So I'm going to let you go. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you everyone for coming.